I used to shoot a lot of film um, growing up and I would shoot and develop my own black and whites. So I kind of had a soft spot for it from then. I just love the like rawness of it and just, it's just only light, you know, not like the only thing you can really read is the light and there's no colors to make you feel a certain way. Black and white for me just like simplifies it a lot. Skateboarding has been a passion of mine since I was a young kid. Just like our guest today, I grew up reading Thrasher magazine and being fascinated by the crazy, distorted fisheye photos. One of the first accessories I got for my camera was a screw-on fisheye adapter for my 18 to 55 kit lens. And to this day, the gritty aesthetic of skateboarding and skate photography still holds a special place in my heart and impacts my work as a wedding and commercial videographer. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Kingsley Atwood, a skate photographer based in Tamaki Makoto, to talk about his work, the importance of storytelling, how to get your photos in a magazine, and what we can all learn from the dynamic, gritty, and distorted aesthetic of skate photography. I kind of started, I'd say around like 14 or just like going into year 10 at high school. Um, jumped into a photography class, didn't own a camera, um, picked up a camera fairly cheap and then kind of was all downhill from there. And I was just skating like every weekend with my friends and stuff anyway. So I took the camera out while I was skating and then um, almost like learned to shoot photos while on a session, I guess you could say. I just like pull the camera out yeah. and just muck around with settings and tr try to get timing down and uh, see what white balance did. <laughs> Let's see what exposure, <laughs> yeah. you know, shutter speeds and shooting at different apertures was doing and even like different ISOs or different lenses what would affect it so i kind of just jumped in like pretty late on i'd say um, you know mid mid teens for just photography class and then was hooked <laughs> was it just skating that you mainly focused your photography on was there any other aspects because I, I know you do a lot of like portraits and stuff as well as part of your work um did that come in later or was was photographing people all wrapped up in in the whole skate photography um as well. it kind of like went hand in hand almost like i would shoot uh say if i was shooting like a skate photo i would almost like set myself like get a portrait after they land it to capture that moment and you know just look back on um but then i found like i really enjoyed shooting portraits anyway and it um just like, took off from like from that kind of made me more interested in shooting people and um you know i really like the compression that lenses have when someone's real close and the backgrounds are blurry and stuff like that and you can't always get that from a skate photo so i'd you know want to shoot that mm -hmm. um portrait at the same time but um but yeah as soon as someone like landed a trick i'd like capture their excitement with, with a portrait whether that would be set up or just in the moment candid type of type of vibe as you started to develop and you got sort of the basics mm -hmm. down um, and you started, I guess, looking for like creative and style inspiration. Where did you sort of look to, you know, was it just like skate magazines and skate photographers or were you looking a little broader? Like where, where did you start to pick up your inspiration to sort of land on your exact style? Um, I would kind of just like at the start, I would just go on YouTube and just kind of go like YouTube anything on how to use the camera. Um, I found that there was like a skate channel doing some tutorials that were just based on skate photography in general. So like, I'd watch those and then obviously magazines. I used to have a mm -hmm. subscription to Thrasher that would come every month. So I'd be looking at that. There'll be a couple of local ones here that I would, would have in the school library. So I'd be, you know, looking through those and just seeing what I liked and whatnot. It wasn't, until I went to uni that I started looking a little deeper into things and like going through fashion magazines and fashion books and looking into photographers that were more, I don't know, more into like portraits and lifestyle imagery rather than just solidly skateboarding. And then mm. I found this one dude, um, Jean-Louis Psef and just fell in love with his black and white work and was like, I want to do that and just kind of took a lot of inspiration from what he was doing mixed with what I'd already kind of been doing. And I guess that's how I, mm. and I said on my own style, I feel like it changes every now and again, but 
I, yeah, yeah, as everyone does. I drew everyone a lot does. of inspiration yeah. from that from that photographer in general. Yeah. Well, let's transition now um, into your black and whites because you do a lot of bl- black and white, and not every f- photographer does. So, what about black and white photography? Do you love? Like, what is it about a black and white photo? That um, you love? I used to shoot a lot of film um, growing up, and I would shoot and develop my own black and whites. So I kind of had a soft spot for it from then. Um, shooting a lot of 120, heaps of 35 mil black and white film. Mm. Um, I just love the like rawness of it and just, it's just only light, you know, not like the only thing you can really read is the light and there's no colors to make you feel a certain way. So I, I like how that um, translates into the photo and then just like, yeah, the rawness, grittiness, especially if you're shooting like a high ISO, you get that real grainy texture and nowadays in photoshop you can almost like mimic what a 120 film or 35 millimeter film would look like so um yeah i just take a you know try to make it look as filmy as possible when i'm shooting my black and whites and the contrast as well do you feel like yeah do you feel like there's something in black and white photography because it's you're you know you're taking one extra element out of the picture you're taking color out of the picture and whenever you add constraints you add creativity so is there something in like practicing black and white photography that improves you as an overall photographer when you go back to shooting color um i almost find shooting black and white a little easier to be honest because i i struggle with like color correction in photoshop and i always have so um black and white for me just like simplifies it a lot but um i guess it does translate like I use when I was shooting with the R6 at the Bowl Jam, I had my, um, the like, you know what you call it, like the screen set to black and white. The, yeah. The live view. The, and I was yeah. just shooting purely black and white, just focusing on the light that day. Um, and then ended up mm. editing most of the photos in black and white anyway. But, um, yeah. yeah, I really liked that with the R6. Like that was cool. I could see in black and white mm. what I was shooting. But I guess it does translate a little bit into, into the color stuff, like just in terms of the, the way that light, the way that I look at the light, it just simplifies it for me when I'm, when I'm shooting. Yeah. I think, I think that's the thing is that it just, yeah, it simplifies the frame that you're looking at and does make you think about the light. And I guess even if it's a, it's a subconscious thing, like the more you are aware of the light, the more you'll just get used to seeing good light and seeing how light affects people and your subject yeah. and, and stuff. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. And she, yeah, I, I, I did see you um, with the, with the live view set up in black and white on the day, which, which looked pretty cool. It's a cool way to just get a, a different perspective at, you know, in the moment yeah, as you're shooting, I, just because obviously we don't see in black and white. Yeah. Having that setting as well, yeah. almost like added a bit more excitement to the, um, to like using the, mm. the, like I've never used the, digital viewfinder before and like the fact that i found out you could turn it into black and white i was pretty stoked so (laughs) it was like added a little bit more fun to shooting it as well skate photography is one of those genres that has a lot lot of tropes a lot of quote-unquote rules what of those tropes of those rules in skate photography do you try to stick to and which of those which sort of skate photography tropes do you sort of try and steer away from to uh you know, to distinguish your own style? Um, I guess like the one rule, like I kind of always keep in mind is that um, I said it in the, in the video from the day is like, keep it, Mm. keep it in mind. Like it's got to be like a story. So you need to like show the entire scene. So it's read easily. So I could take off the trick itself and then the landing. So you're not, like I try to keep those three elements in, in mind when I'm always, Mm shooting i don't want to you don't want to you know cut off the landing out of frame and then there could be something kind of that adds an extra i don't know gnarliness to the spot and that little extra bit of frame um and then stuff that i try to steer away from or break the rules on um i like stitching photos together i think that's pretty like it's yeah you can mess things up pretty easily but if, when it works, it really works. Like, like when you do, do like a burst frame or like multiple exposures from different times. Um, like so from like different. Almost types. like I'll use a 
telephoto lens shoot like yep. say this half of the if my screen is the frame i'll shoot like one frame two frame three frame yep. four and then stitch them all together in photoshop and then yeah it, it almost yeah, like yeah. Mimics. um what's it called Bren, the Brenzi, Brenzium method is uh, that what it's I'm called i'm not too sure but it yeah it's, it almost um, recreates it was, it's, it's got some name like that where the, yeah you do like stitch multiple telephotos and you get like a almost like a yeah. medium format sort of style yeah it recreates field. that compression yeah from stitching all those telephoto shots yeah. together yeah yeah it's 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 a cool yeah effect. like even when it's not seamless it looks cool like when you can see almost like the vig vignetting of the edges or you know the contrast yeah. between frames if you're shooting at different exposures i think that looks pretty cool as well but um yeah creating that seamless one is yeah when it works it looks perfect yeah it looks great yeah yeah yeah, but that's something. The the imperfectness is that there's a bit of wiggle room in the world of skate photography because, like, skate culture likes a grittiness, it likes a, a rawness. Um, so you can get away from the perfectness, and I like because I th- I'm thinking about like um, like photo layouts and Thrasher and stuff, and they're often like all like sort of off center and they've got like multiple shots, like not perfectly all aligned, like all sort of like jumbled next to it, each other. And you can get a bit kind of, you know, scrapbooky yeah. with it and it all kind of fits the aesthetic. You can almost like hack it out um, with scissors and just glue everything back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Almost like the, the, you know, like, um, like a 35 millimeter, like proof sheet that's just been like chopped up and scribbled on and like just chucked on a, on a, on a light table yeah. or something. Yeah. And even that in itself would be a, cool thing to look at (laughs) yeah exactly um yeah and so i guess there's one element um that we talked about a bit in the video but it'd be good to sort of bring up here on the podcast for anyone who um uh, hasn't uh, seen the video content we did with you but um the element of the fisheye lens in skate photography Mm -hmm. and because just going back to what you were saying around like the storytelling element because i think the sort of it all kind of makes sense um, when you think about like why fish eyes are used in skate photography, um, because like something like lens like that does allow you to like have your subject like large in the frame, but then also have like the beginning of the spot, you know, like their takeoff and then the, the end of the spot, their landing in the frame as well. So sort of, like shrunk down so you can still see it. Like it's wide enough to kind of capture I the guess, whole scene. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it, it, it's an interesting lens and, when you think about it from that storytelling perspective, I think is, 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 is my point there because like, yeah. 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 Cause Being like, so wide, it kind of just grabs uh, everything. <laughs> so you can almost be like, you can almost be yeah, messy with that lens and not, um, compose, you know, a hundred percent. Cause you can, you, you, it's so wide. So even if you're inches away from the skateboard, you can still see take off the trick itself and the landing. And it, being the closer you are, the more distorted everything is, the more crazy it looks, the more interesting it is to the viewer. Well, like, um, I love yeah. that lens. I mean, you know, not, not a perfect lens for everyone. I don't think um, someone would no. enjoy their wedding photos being taken on it. But um, Well, I mean, look, you know, who knows? Who knows? But it's the kind of thing that I think it's, it's such an interesting and, and unique lens um, that is so comfortable in the world of skating. I think there's, it's something that people can learn from it. Looking at like looking at and breaking down how skate photographers use that lens and what it can do mm. in regards to like storytelling and like showing your subject and the and the environment they're in. It's, I've seen it's it really used a couple of times in um, like in surf photography, especially like with the underwater housing and stuff, and mm. like being able to be so close and you still get that like submerged like piece of the frame and then the surfer itself or i've seen it in car photography as well and um just being super close to it and there's all the movement and like that looks crazy cool as well it's it's pretty versatile i think it works real well in sports but then also um portraits like all those old hip-hop covers and from the 90s with like the hasselblad and the big old fisheye like Mm -hmm. those look I almost have that same aesthetic as skating. Like you know, it's a little dirty, some distorted. Yeah, yeah but absolutely. It's definitely it brings yeah. that viewer. It in. definitely had a had a heyday in 
in the 90s for sure around hip-hop and stuff and i think because the 90s and the early noughts are so like on trend at the moment i feel like the fish eyes due to just like have an absolute resurgence it's a fantastic lens yeah i love it yeah i love it it's um it's a (laughs) go-to It's always yeah, in the bag. Talk, talking about other types of gear now, as we transition into like talking about how you um how you how you actually do what you do, how you like, like what's involved the, the logistics you the logistics of you going out on a skate mission to take some photos. Um, let's just segue straight into the rest of your gear, and then we can go from there. So, what do you bring on a skate mission? Being out and about most of the time, like we don't always have a have a car, or we might be in the like middle of the city and not have access to parking or whatnot. So you want to keep it pretty tight. You don't want to be carrying around 30 kgs worth of gear all day. Um, you know, come home and barely be able to walk the next day. Um, so I try to keep it pretty, pretty lightweight, um, just as easy as it can get off my back and get my gear set up. Um, but I take with me on every single session, I take the same setup take my body being the 5d um i take the 85 the 50 and the fish eye and then three uh off camera speed lights and triggers um just if i need them if it's a dark spot i'll always carry the flashes um those hypersync as well so you can shoot at like a one one thousandth of a second and have flashes so you know not risking any you know blurriness coming to the yeah, yeah yeah so that that's yeah. that's pretty much what i take every single day and then i strap two light stands to the, my back and then just use one of those tiny little um like mini tripods for the third flash <laughs> just oh, to yeah. keep everything nice yeah, and nice. lightweight it's often a, a juggle eh? like um balancing like you want to bring as much gear as you know all the options in the world but at the end of the day you need to like for you, especially if you're like actually on your board as well, like skating from spot to spot, you can only take so oh, much. Oh yeah, yeah. And if you, uh, you've probably seen videos of people like hitting rocks and going over the front, or maybe even oh, done it yourself. Yeah. But um, oh, I've done it myself. Yeah, yeah. If you've got twenty plus kgs on your back and you hit a rock, you can't stop. <laughs> you can't run out of it. So it's um, no. you don't want to risk breaking your gear as yeah. well. So there's that too. So into the actual um the day itself so what how does it sort of go down for you in terms of like okay you've got your you got your gear you've got your board you know the you've got your your crew um what's involved with you guys going out and getting some photos um it'll either go like one or two ways like uh it'll either be just like a spontaneous everyone meets up at skate park or meets up and has breakfast and then we'll kind of like sit around and discuss like, Oh, what do you, do you want to get any photos at this spot? Do you want to go to this spot? We can check out this place. And then it will just, you know, be spontaneous and happen. Or it'll be like a pre planned thing to where, you know, uh, someone hits me up and says like, Hey, I've got this in mind. Um, a filmer will come along as well. And then we'll go out on that day just to get that one trick and one photo. So I like get, it's either, it's either one of the two and sometimes the spontaneous one can be way better than the planned one and sometimes the spontaneous one just doesn't work at all you know um, we'll be spending a couple hours at the skate park just in the trap just trapped at the skate park but um yeah that'll pretty much be the how it kind of happens just all link up in the morning get coffee discuss what people want to skate and then go from there or the yeah. pre-planned the pre-planned one's kind of nice sometimes because you can say if you know the spot, I can spend a little longer in my head planning how I want the photo to look or how am I going to light it if, you know, it's dark or mm. what time would be the best time to go there. Like sun, would it be better at sunset when it's, you know, the light's low and just heaps of contrast in the shadows or would it be better early morning or midday? So. I do like both, yeah. but um, pre-planning can yeah. almost make for a better photo sometimes, unless you get real yeah. lucky. <laughs> what's the balance like between? Because with for a lot of photographers, like the the location scouting and the and the planning and the like, going figuring out where you're going to photograph is all part of it. Whereas 
for you, it sounds like it's like sometimes it's coming from you and sometimes it's coming from the skater. So how do you balance, I guess, the like creative aspect of thinking about uh, a spot in terms of how it's going to photograph versus how it's going to skate? Um, I think we're pretty lucky here in New Zealand with like there's a lot of landscapes involved with all the photos, but it is that tough balance. Like uh, it comes down to a, the trick a lot of the time. Um, and depending on which stance the skater is. So like if they're regular or goofy, it just depends on which forward, uh, which foot they have forward. So like it could look awesome if they were regular and they're facing me, but if they're goofy and they're facing, you know, their backs to me, it can look awful. Um, and then just the trick itself as well. It, um, that changes the photo a lot too. Like say if he's doing a trick, that's a 180, and I can get it, you know, sideways. Um, show the spot off a little bit more if he's doing a trick that's a straight, just going straight. Um, it fix the photo too. But in terms of the spot, I try to look for stuff that's yeah, if it's shooting color, nice and bright and colorful. Um, where I can shoot it from that makes it different. Clean background as well, mm. and um, you know you can get get lucky, and some spots can be. You know, picture perfect to say or you can get some duds where there's you know just heaps of trees in the background or there's cars everywhere or you know. so it is a bit of a it's a battle sometimes for sure do you have any sort of i guess like go-to tricks to pretty up a, a spot or make a spot work have you had to like you know um do anything to tweak your surroundings uh, for a shot i've definitely gone to a spot with someone before and then they've said they wanted to do one trick and I've told them no, <laughs> cause it looks bad, but um, <laughs> and they've got a different trick, but um, I kind of just let the, let the skater go wild with it. Cause you know, they're the one, you know, jumping down the set or jumping down a handrail or you know, putting mm. their carcass on the line. So um, I just kind of let yeah. them go into it. But most of the time they'll warm up doing, either like a basic trick or just like an ollie down the set or a 50 down the rail. And then I can kind of like set my lighting up and test everything with that warm up trick, which is, which is nice. Don't have to worry. Yeah. And how long would it, would it usually take you to get a, a photo? Um, whew, it can be, it can be hours or it can be minutes. It can be hours. It could be, you know, multiple times going back to the same spot, different days. Um, on average, we'll probably sit there for at least three hours, two or three hours. You know, maybe not shooting the whole time, but a good hour shooting for sure. And then if he lands it or if he doesn't land it, we'll go back the next day or the following weekend and it'll be a bit of a mission. But as to the fun. In terms of skate photography as a career, photographers from all different disciplines have their own stories around how they like networked and got their way in and stuff. So how do you sort of, um, how did you get your foot in the door and how do you today stay connected in the industry? Um, I kind of just, I kind of got my foot in the door from, I guess just annoyingly emailing lots. (laughs) Um, yeah. I'd go out, you know, shoot a photo or multiple photos on a weekend, come home Sunday night and, and just send, submit to the magazine, um, you know, five or 10 photos for the first, I'd say year they were, were turning them down and then, um, shot one, I'd say like half decent photo and that got run. And, and then I just kept like asking for pointers and hey, what can I, do to help out what can i do different on this photo can you give me any tips on gear and then i kind of was just like that annoying dude that would you know always pop up on the inbox um and then just go to skate competitions meet a lot of people um just try shoot as many people as i could at the time um like there was a few new zealand brands too that were running around when i like first started shooting photos so i'd just try message them on Instagram or Facebook and be like, Hey, do you guys want some photos? I'm learning. I'm still for free, you know, and see what we can do with the photos when it comes time. But, um, yeah, I was just that annoying kid who was on the emails too much and was 
submitting way too many photos probably. <laughs> Do you need to, I guess, keep up your networking with um, like brands and magazines, but also I imagine you would have to keep up your networking and your connection with skaters as, as well. Because I imagine, you know, like skaters would have their preferred photographers. Um, does it matter in, in terms of magazines like who like the variety of people that you're shooting do, do they want you to be shooting lots of different photographers oh, sorry lots of different skaters um, like what's the sort of balance you strike there uh um, it's a bit of both like sometimes um you know you get approached for an event and you'll be shooting people you've never shot before or um which is like a good way to meet people it's just like go to lots of events mm-hmm. and you know uh the, you know, skating is such a small world. They've probably seen your photos before and you can always just hit them up and be like, Hey, do you want to shoot something? Um, I did get a couple, like, uh, I guess you could say like assignments to go shoot people when I was first starting out. They'd be like, Hey, I'll put you in contact with this guy. I'm not in town this week, so you can go and shoot him. But, um, at the moment, most of the people I'm shooting have been just my friends from when I started. And, um, you know, I've traveled a lot with those dudes and they're just like my best friends anyway. So we go out and skate most weekends and then I just bring the camera along. And they're gnarly enough to uh, be getting photos in the magazine. So it helps me and it helps them yeah. at the same time too. But I mean, you know, they're, they're my friends. So I just keep that, that relationship going in terms of brands and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely approach people, um, send emails, um, yeah, you know, hit people up on Instagram. Instagram seems to be the best networking platform right now, I'd say. And then just emailing off your yeah. work and, you know, making sure you've got a good portfolio behind you, nice and clean. Do you have any other sort of advice for people who are interested in getting into skate photography? Uh, um, like where to yeah. start? Um, probably the best way is honestly shooting a, shooting a skate comp is good because, you know, there's lots of tricks going as much as it's not the most fun, um, like if you're just starting out and you're not in front of the bowl with a fish eye or, you know, you haven't got your, mm. like everything down pat, it's like the best way because there's so many tricks going down. So you get a lot of opportunities to get used to timing, get used to lighting. And it's also kind of like being so busy. It's a good way to learn how to frame stuff because there's a lot of people. So you yeah. kind of almost like that's how I learned was just like learning how to frame stuff in such a busy atmosphere that makes for a clean photo. Um, Cause then you can transition that into, you know, when you're just out on the session with one or two dudes and say, if the background's just covered in windows or, you know, trees is like I was saying before, you almost learn from that skate bike session, how to frame something up a little bit cleaner to the eye guess you could say but like that's a good way to learn otherwise just um youtube has endless loopholes and rabbit holes of um, tutorial videos how to use cameras there's a really good skateboarding um like how to with using a fisheye flashes and stuff that i um that i learned i'm not sure if it's still on youtube but you could probably find it if you dug into the archives enough and then emailing other photographers was a big one when I started Um, magazines asking for advice. Other photographers send them, you know, five or ten of your favorite photos and be like, hey, what do you think of these ones? Just a quick, um, you know, constructive criticism. And then don't take it too heavy-heartedly, but (laughs) Mm. just ask what what they think you could do better or, you know, and feel free to ask me as well if you want. (laughs) Hit my DM. A couple of last questions questions to finish us off um just talking about like just skate photography and photography in general really um if we start with you personally what are some of your favorite images you've taken and uh, why uh probably my f- all-time favorite would be the milton martinez kickflip at the car wash when i was over in la um pre-covid um Mm. just it was like my first time shooting pro skaters also first time being in la being in the states in general so there was a lot of excitement 
from that. And then the photo I got out of it is probably the one I'm the most proud of. Um, other than that would be my friend, me and my friend Yolan, we shot our first cover together. It was my first cover and his first cover. And then just sharing that experience with him was, was pretty sick. Made our um, friendship closer, that's for sure. And uh, seeing your yeah. photo on the front cover of a magazine is an experience like none other. So, yeah, that's yeah. one of my favorites for sure. It's a, yeah, a bucket list. Oh, feed. yeah, hugely. I'm, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it was cool to see my yeah. dad's face when um, when I showed that to him. So yeah, yeah. That added to That's it. That's awesome. Too. Cool, man. Alrighty, last question. And so, just talking about like skate photography in general. Now we've talked about it a little bit, but what, in your opinion, makes a great skate photo? Not just like a good skate photo. What makes a great skate photo? In my opinion, it comes down to the to the way that the skater does the trick. I think. Um, that's what I really look for is like, um, you know, some of my favorite photos are just like real simple, like favorite skate photos are just real simple, almost like flat ground skateboarding tricks. So, you know, just doing a kickflip on flat. And if he does it, I'm sure you can imagine like a Bruce Lee ninja kick Mm. type kickflip. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just like on a nice clean wall or, uh, like if the lighting, I really enjoy looking at, photos that have lots of rim lighting. Um, there's a photographer called Oliver Barton who's amazing with his rim lighting. He's a skateboard photographer as well. And, um, I drew a lot of inspiration from, from his photos too. Um, but good lighting, good colors if it's in color or if it's black and white, I like that real contrasty look. And then just the form and timing of the skate trick itself. All of those combined and that's what I enjoy looking at. Yeah, which tends to be most magazines. I like that. (laughs) Yeah, now I like that as an answer because it's not entirely you as the photographer. Yeah, you know, it's partly like the skater, and that comes down to putting in, you know, the time and the mahi to be there when they do do the trick like that. You know, I'm sure it's been like it's. I'm sure you've been on hundreds of missions that you know don't have that track but when you get it like that time when you know in in la with milton it's like you were there because of all the effort you put in leading up to yeah it. Um, so even if it's you know comes down to um how the skater's doing the trick as to what makes a great skate photo that it does come back to you in the sense that like you have to put in the time to be there at the right moment to click the shutter when they do do it. Yeah. I think my main, main thing going into it is I want to make them look as almost like as good as possible, as gnarly as possible. So I'll do anything. As cool as yeah, possible. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. I'll do anything yeah. to make that happen. For Sam. Yeah. Cool. Amazing, man. Well, I think it's a great pl- place to finish. Uh, Kingsley, thank you. Thank you for your time and for sharing your work and your, and your story and stuff. Um, I have links to all your work below and um, yeah, man, it's cool, cool to, to chat and hear about your work. Hey, thank you. No stress. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. Alrighty. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.